Good morning. How are we all doing today? Great. Good. I'm going to start out with a little question. How many of you are not currently in a Toastmasters club? Got one. Okay, that's great. One, two? Was there two? Two. So we have two guests. That's spectacular. Welcome. Welcome to this event. But for the rest of you, you're in at least one club. Is anyone in multiple Toastmasters clubs? One, two, three. So most of you are seeing at least two to three speeches per week. Is that right? Those of you who are in multiple clubs, you're seeing more. Six, eight, ten speeches per week. My question to you is, how many of these speeches that you've seen over the years? Can you remember? How many of them are so special to you that even months or years after you saw them, you can recall with detail what the speech was about? Can somebody give me an example of a speech that they heard at a club that stood out in their minds? Anyone? Yes. One of my fellow Toastmasters gave a speech about a camping trip, and she described the actions of a baby bear so well, I'll never forget it. Wow. <laughs> a baby bear and a camping bear. trip. A baby bear who had never been around people before. He was hiding. <laughs> hiding. He thought he was hiding. He was covering his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> they can't see me. They can't see me. I'm not here. I'm just a furry rock. I love it. What a wonderful example. Does somebody else have one that they can think of? Right off the top of their head. Yes? I've got one where a mother was playing with her kid, tossing him on the bed, and she broke his arm. Oh, oh, nice. oh boy. And her whole description of the whole event and everything that was going on. Oh, wow. As a, She's very vivid. As, uh, are, are you a mother yourself? No. Okay. But I bet you could totally imagine what it must have been like. Explaining to the doctor how your child got distracted. Child Protective <laughs> Services maybe coming in a little along those lines. That must have been terrible. So we have a few examples. But it should be amazing to you, I would think, that you hear all these speeches every week, and yet to recall them later, even a few that were just that special, it's a difficult task. Well, that's really in the norm. In fact, almost everything that we gain in our short-term memory, most of that does not transfer into long-term memory. And there are very specific reasons for this. There are very specific reasons why things are transferred from short-term memory, which is what you're getting now, into long-term memory. And that's my goal today. I've really delve deep into studying the human brain and how and why we remember things and how and why things get transferred from short-term memory into long-term memory. And my goal here today is to share these ideas with you so that when you give your next speech, the people in the audience, if they were here today, they would be able to recall what you talked about and how it made an impact on their lives. Because that's what we all want, right? We want to stand up here and do a good job and be eloquent. But we really want to be remembered, don't we? And so that's what today is about. I'm going to share with you five rules that you should follow when you're preparing all of your presentations. Not just in Toastmasters, but for the rest of your lives. With a goal of being remembered. So let's dig into it. The five rules for a memorable presentation. Rule number one, make them feel emotion. It seems intuitive, right? We heard a couple of examples that were really wonderful examples of speeches that were remembered. The first one was about a baby bear. And it was great to hear this. It was amusing. It kind of made us all laugh. You could also imagine things from the bear's perspective. We had the shock of a child breaking his arm. These emotions that we feel have helped cement that into long-term memory for them. 
<clears throat> but the real reason why this happens actually goes much deeper. Our understanding of what transcribes into long-term memory actually crystallizes back because of a surgery done in 1953. There was an epileptic patient, a guy named Henry Malaysen. We have one nodding head. Does anybody else know about Henry Malaysen? This gentleman, by the age of 27, was having upwards of 15 grand mal seizures per day. He was the most extreme epileptic that had been found in our country at that time. They had tried everything, every drug known to man, electroshock therapy, everything they could think of, and nothing was having an impact on this guy's seizures. So the doctors, all the way back in 1953, decided to try something radical. They decided to remove his entire hippocampus. It's an entire region of your brain. In 1953, <laughs> we're not talking about real high-tech stuff here. But the hippocampus and the amygdala are really the emotional centers of the brain. That's where emotions are processed and distributed. And it was thought that manipulating this could affect some of the epileptic seizures that people were having. And so for somebody as extreme as Henry, they decided to remove the entire thing. The surgery in 1953 was a complete success. Henry woke up, and as of that surgery, it was the last seizure he had. Doctors were celebrating, high-fiving. We've solved it. We got it left. But the cost of the surgery revealed itself pretty soon thereafter. Henry was not able to transfer any short-term memories into long-term memories. He could remember everything up to, everything up to the surgery, because it was already encoded in his brain, was right there, ready to go. Post-surgery, everything that he learned instantly out of short-term memory and didn't transfer into long-term memory. Henry lived to be 87 years old. He woke up every day thinking that he was 27 years old, coming right out of surgery. Did anyone see that movie, Fifty First Dates? Yeah. yeah. That was based on Henry Melissa and his issue. So the point of all this, for our benefit, is that when it comes to transferring ideas from short-term memory into long-term memory, it has everything to do with the processing in our hippocampus, which is emotional processing. Now, as it turns out, Henry contributed more to our understanding of the human brain than anyone has ever done. There are actually a couple of different types of learning. One is experiential learning, which is what we're about. We get up and we deliver a speech, which is an experience for people to share and understand. That is what was affected by the removal of the hippocampus. There's also procedural memory, which is how we learn to do things. Ride a bike. How do you know how to ride a bike? Well, I learned how. Now I know the procedure. I can hop on. I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't think about it. I just jump on and cruise. As it turns out, Henry was able to do these types of things, no problem. He could learn all kinds of new skills. He just never had any recollection of having learned them. An amazing study, but the point is this. You make them feel emotion, hard emotion, that will transfer from short term memory into long term memory. I put the theater faces up there because those are the two main kinds of emotion that we feel, right? Sadness, anger, fear, and then happiness, joy, laughter. As it turns out, that the, the fear and the anger and the sadness and the shock. We feel deeper. That's why a lot of the more memorable speeches that we hear are more shocking. They're life-altering. But we 
can't hold on to that emotion exclusively for long periods of time. So if you really want to transfer something from short-term memory into long-term, you want to include both sadness and joy. Something that shocks and something that makes us laugh. If you can put multiple emotions into your speech, you have a high likelihood of having that transfer in the long term. So that's rule number one. Make them feel emotion. Because as they leave, they probably won't remember what you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. Number two. Connect with something that is familiar to your audience. As it turns out, the brain doesn't really remember things the way we thought it did. Originally, we thought the brain was like a bunch of compartments and boxes, kind of like our garage. You know, a bunch of boxes where we store our fall stuff and our winter stuff and our Christmas stuff and our spring stuff and all little boxes. And so we kind of thought that that's how memory worked. It's a bunch of little boxes in our brain and we could take this experience or whatever it was and lock it away in this box. As it turns out, our brains are amazing computers at interrelational work. The brain looks at every new situation and instantly tries to compare it to what's already up in there, what's already in our experience. And so the fastest way to get something transferred from short-term into long-term memory is to find something that it can, the brain can connect to, something that the brain already knows. And so that's why I like handle my introductions, whatever I'm speaking about, whether I'm sharing a new idea or something strange or something different, I always try in my introduction to make a real connection with the audience. Get them thinking, hey, this guy is in my shoes. He knows what I'm dealing with. That's how I started today. Ideas of your own Toastmasters Club, getting you to think about your experiences with the people in your clubs. And what made you remember certain speeches, and what made you not remember certain speeches. So it was that connection to your experience with your own clubs that will hopefully help transfer what I'm teaching today from short-term memory into long-term memory. When you leave, you'll remember. So rule number two, connect with something that is familiar to your crowd. Rule number three. This gets all the way back to speech number two. Who remembers speech number two in their Calpitic Communicator Manual? What was it? Somebody. Get to, the point. Get to the point. What a fun idea. And it's amazing when people first start out in Toastmasters, they look at five to seven minutes and they think, well, i got to have at least a couple of points in the speech, two or three well-developed ideas, five to seven minutes. And then what happens when we get a little further into our Toastmasters career? We realize five to seven minutes is no time. No time. You got enough time for one idea, maybe, if you develop it right. I did a lot of thinking about this, and it's interesting. Most people, when they think of writing a speech, they think it should look like this. Is this familiar? You've got an intro. Point, couple sub points, point, couple sub. Is this familiar to everybody? This is how you write a speech, right? I will submit to you that speeches worth listening to and worth remembering don't look like this. A speech worth remembering looks like this. It takes your audience on an individual basis who walks in with a preconceived notion, an idea, your understanding of how your world around you works. And using your message, you change them from X to Y, whatever that is. Whatever that singular point or idea of your speech is. Did anybody see the movie Inception? A couple of nuggets. For those of you who didn't see the movie, the idea was pretty radical. 
it was about a group of people who would attempt to invade your dreams so that they could plant the seed of an idea that would later drive your action. It had to be one very clear, very concise point that they would attempt to implant in your subconscious mind through your dreams. Inception is what you're after when you're presenting. And that's why you have to be very clear and very concise about what point you're trying to share with your audience. You need to know exactly what idea you want to plant in their mind that is going to later drive their behavior to move them from X to Y. And if you can't sum up the purpose of your speech, that singular point, in one very tight sentence, you got to go back to the drawing board and you have to tighten things up. Because that's what it's all about. Messages worth remembering. Rule number four, everybody's favorite. Tell stories. How many times have we heard tell stories in your speech? I love telling stories. It's great because you don't have to memorize them. You're just telling a story. It's easy. Has anybody watched Dr. Oz in here? No, anybody willing to admit that they watched Dr. Oz in here? <laughs> Michael shaking his head. Absolutely not. I don't watch Dr. Oz, but my wife does. She watches him religiously. And I try to tune him out. But you can't, can you? You're trying to do some work, but your mind keeps drifting up here. Dr. Oz does something interesting. Whatever point he is making in his presentation, whatever he's trying to share with the audience, he always tells a story with a demonstration. And the demonstrations are bizarre. He's always coming up with, here, this piece of tubing is your liver. <laughs> and this pair of pantyhose is your pancreas. And he comes up with this, and then this jello is going to run through it. And he brings people up. And he will actually go through the process of mushing jello through the stuff, and they get all messy. <laughs> and I was wondering, why does he do this? <laughs> These ridiculous demonstrations of something that is so easy. We, I mean, we get it. It's unhealthy. Okay, I get it. But it's the story with the demonstration that sticks. So in the spirit of Dr. Oz, I'm going to try a little demonstration here today. But I will need a volunteer from the audience. Absolutely. Come on up. I'm sorry, what's your name? Thomas. Thomas. Welcome, Thomas. Let's give Thomas a hand. I have my Dr. Oz goodie bag here. You notice it says Whole Foods, right? So it's got to be it's got to be something wholesome, that sort of thing. Now, our idea of a speech with a lot of information in it is kind of like this bag of wheat here. We have a lot of facts, we have a lot of figures, a lot of data that we're going to try to pass to our audience member. Are you ready? Catch as much of this as you can. <laughs> Got some on your head. Wipe it off. So how much of that were you able to retain? A couple little pieces here and there. But if you put together the details of your speech into a story, a fully baked piece of bread. Dr. Oz bread, too. Look at all these seeds. <laughs> so we've taken all these facts and figures, we've baked it into a nice story. Now, bingo! <laughs> he's able to capture... <laughs> so he's able to capture and retain the information in the story and the facts and the figures because they're all baked together. Now, let's take our story and add emotion. That's the stickiness, right? The stickiness associated with this bread. And so we take this, our delicious, organic, grass-fed peanut butter. Yeah, you know. <laughs> grass-fed, non 
GMO, whatever. Yeah. The, the peanuts were out in the field. Okay. <laughs> and then we add a nice bit of emotion, that stickiness. And now, is it going to be able to stick <laughs> effectively? <laughs> I'm just <laughs> I'm just joking. Thank you so much for your But you get the idea. It's the story that binds all of the details together and makes it easy for us to retain. And the peanut butter is the stickiness. That's the emotion. That's what sticks to us whether we want to catch the story or not. It's all there for you. So telling stories, that is by far the most effective, the most valuable way to have things remembered. You saw two examples of it here. Did you hear about facts and figures, about something new and different? No, you heard a story about a bear and a story about a kid breaking his arm. That's what sticks with us, is the story. Rule number five, use pictures, use pictures. We also know this rule as no death by PowerPoint. Has everybody heard death by PowerPoint? Who experiences this in their job on a daily basis? I see several hands going up. Oh yeah, most of the time when we see a PowerPoint presentation, it looks like this, right? Well, what happens when you throw up a PowerPoint presentation like this on the board. People read it, right? And then are they paying attention to you as the speaker? Not at all. They're reading your story. If you want people locked in on you and focused on you, your slides have to look like what the rest of these slides have looked like, pictures. The experts say no more than six words on a slide. Six. That's not much. But as they say, a picture tells a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Include those pictures in your presentations to give support and detail. Because people will remember the pictures and how that associates with what you do. Does anybody have the prop comics in their clubs? The people who love to bring props with them and <coughs> show them at each meeting? I know we do. A lot of people, when they give speeches, they'll bring props. Those are Pictures, just in 3D. Use these in your speech, and I guarantee they'll be more memorable. So there we are. Five ways to make your presentations go from short-term memory into long-term memory. Make them feel emotion. Connect to something that they know. Okay. Trying to remember what number three is. Have Somebody clear, help me. Have, have a clear purpose. purpose. Have a clear purpose. Awesome. Number four. Tell stories. Tell stories. And number five. Use pictures. Use pictures. Use pictures. Wow, you guys paid attention. That was fantastic. I'm going to share with you a secret, though. There's one more way. One more way to be memorable. And that is to get up there and fail so badly, you'll be remembered forever. <laughs> How many of us have witnessed that? And we remember. How many of you witnessed that in your office, on the job? Yeah. See, most people don't do what you're doing. Most people don't join a Toastmasters club or some form of organization to help them develop these speaking skills before they need them. They wait until their company assigns them a presentation. And usually it's along the lines of, hey, we need you to speak for an hour in front of the senior vice presidents tomorrow. <laughs> That's how it normally goes. And so we stay up all night, and we work, and we write out a 75-page PowerPoint presentation detailing everything that we're going to talk about. And we get up there, and sometimes we do okay, 
But more times than not, it's a bump. And they go, Phew, thank God I don't have to do that again. But the problem is, that bump is remembered. And it can be career ending. So I applaud those of you who are in here who have joined Toastmasters Clubs to help develop those speaking and leadership skills. Because really, speaking is something that you develop over time. It's like exercise. It's like going to the gym, right? You go to the gym, you can't suddenly become ripped and buff and beautiful in a night. You gotta go again and again and again. And that's what you've all committed yourselves to. I want you all not only to commit to stay with Toastmasters, but to take things another step further. I want you to look for as many opportunities to get up and speak as you can. Be that person with their hand up volunteering for every available position. Because you know what? It's not about getting up there and making a perfect speech every time. It's about getting up there and saying something. Because the more you practice, just like going to the gym and moving those weights around, the more you do it, the better you'll be. And so in your career, when it's time to get up there, you'll be remembered as a great presenter, as somebody who changes lives, as somebody who will be remembered long after they give their presentation. So I want you all to remember this. <laughs> If you're going to take the time to stand up here and speak, make it memorable, make sure you stand out in a good way. Any questions? Yes? Yes, on your number, can you have a third purpose? So you mean just one Just purpose. one. Just one. What is the transfer that you're looking for? What is the X to Y? What, what do you want to move your audience to know or understand? That's the question that you should be, be able to answer. It's the, why am I listening to this, right? I know a lot of people who are great storytellers. I hear great storytellers in Toastmasters all the time. But here's the problem that many of them run into, is they never let you know why you're listening to that story. I mean, it was fun, it was entertaining, but how does that apply to me? But what's in it for me principle? If you can't make that transition, if you can't teach them why they move from X to Y, if you haven't had that inception, it won't be removed. Yes? So that purpose should be presented at the beginning in the intro or at the conclusion? Yes and yes. <laughs> you want to, like a well-worn path, you want to drive that home. It's kind of how the memory works as well. That's where the repetition comes in and the memorization comes in. It's that path that if you walk one time and then take a different path the next time and a different path the next time, it won't be well worn in and it won't be permanent. But if you can walk that path again and again, in your intro, in your body, in the stories that you're telling, in the conclusion, if it's not there again and again and again, it won't be removed. So yes, in the intro, in the middle, in the conclusion, and everywhere else. Drive that point out. Anyone else? Yes? How can you not be overly passionate? I'm a passionate person. Is too much passion bad? Oh, no, don't, don't misunderstand. Passion is good. Passion is all about your engagement and your believability with the audience. When I said don't be too much on the sad face. You remember the, the happy and, and sad faces. What I meant was, it, it's difficult to take a speech that is nothing but pain. You ever heard those presentations where, I mean, it feels like you've been through the ringer because the, the pain and anguish felt by the person delivering is so much. It, it's, it can be tough to listen to. But if you can add in some interesting, humorous parts in there to lighten the mood occasionally, that cements it much better into the, into the long-term memory. 
That's what, what really helps that. I saw an amazing video about a woman who was a neuroscientist, and she documented, as it was happening, her own aneurysm. You saw that? Yeah, I know. Yeah. And amazing, amazing, astonishing story. And as she was going through the shock of experiencing this aneurysm, there, there were elements of humor in there where people were falling out of their chairs. And that's what made it so vivid and so memorable. Was as she was blacking out here, she was talking about talking to her colleague, and her colleague going, <laughs> because her brain was no longer able to process language. And she said, I thought to myself, he sounds like a Labrador Retriever. <laughs> And so I said, whoa, 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 whoa. and I thought, I sound like a Labrador Retriever. And those elements of laughter in the midst of all the pain and anguish she was going through really helped some It was a great stroke great of insight. Stroke of insight is what it's called. Yeah. Definitely. Yes, it is. It's, it's a TED Talk, and I definitely recommend watching it. It, it was amazing. Any other questions? I thank you all for coming out today. This was videotaped, so if you would like a copy for yourself or to share with others, it will probably be up on the D5 Toastmasters website, or you can also make a note on your papers there. If you think you would like a copy sent directly to you, I'll happily do that in a couple of days. I hope you have a wonderful conference, and I thank you for coming in. Let's give Jason another hand. That was a nice <laughs> Okay, who thought I was going to throw the peanut butter? <laughs> <laughs> thought it was.